and what an exciting day it is because uh, we get to announce that we have met and exceeded our Lottie Moon goal. Now, hold on just a moment. Hold on. Don't clap yet because I want you, I want to give you the full picture and then uh, I want us to thank God for his faithfulness because uh, whether you gave a little bit or a lot or whether this year that just wasn't something that was uh, part of what you did this year in, in your generosity, um, I want you to know that ultimately it comes down to God's faithfulness. Uh, even what we give is a reflection of God's faithfulness. And so this year, uh, our goal was $25,000. Uh, I want you to know that as far back as, as I can find in our records, the most that we've ever received for Lottie Moon was uh, a couple of years ago where we brought in, uh, in $27,000 toward that, uh, that offering. This year, you gave $31,000 to Lottie Moon. So, can you thank the Lord for his faithfulness? And, you know, I'm so excited. Um, I want to let y'all in on a little secret. Uh, every week at the end of our services, either Brent or Ralph, they come and close the service and they, they do a giving moment and they share with you something that, uh, that God has done. And, and because of your generosity and God's faithfulness through your giving, uh, we want you to know that this is what's happening in our church. So almost every week, I end up stealing uh, what they're going to talk about by, when I come up here. So I see Ralph right now. I'm basically stealing what Ralph is going to talk about. But y'all be just as excited when he comes up and talks about it uh, because also we have a mission team who's going to work next week. They're leaving next Saturday and, uh, or this Saturday, and they're going to work with one of our IMB missionaries. And I, I want to tell you that because I want to ask you to do something. You've given You've prayed. Uh, some of you have, have bought the items for the missionary family uh, that is on the, uh, that they're going to serve with. Uh, I can't say where they are serving, and I can't even say their last names, uh, but their first names are Jared and Whitney. They've been here with us. Uh, some of you know them, and you'll remember them. Just a fantastic family. Uh, they moved to Southeast Asia to work in a Muslim population with their two young children. God has since blessed them with a third child. Uh, they are faithful servants of the Lord, serving in a very difficult context on the other side of the world from where their family of origin is, where their culture they're used to. They've had to learn a new language. They were, they were uh, stationed in one place uh, before COVID. Because of COVID, they had to leave that place, and they were reassigned to another place. So now they're learning another new language, and they're just a tremendous couple. And we've just kind of made it our mission as a church to just embrace this couple and serve them and help them. So here's what I want to ask you to do. You find Brent or Haley Vance uh, after service, and if you happen to have a $20 bill in your pocket, would you just give it to them and say, this is for Jared and Whitney, and what that money is going to is just for them, just to take care of them, whatever they may need. Uh, if the Lord would move you to do that, or if you have $20 in your pocket, take that as the Lord's leading for you to do that. Find Brent or Haley and just hand, this is my $20. It's going in there in their pocket so that we can bless uh, that missionary. And if you can't find them for some reason, uh, then talk with me afterwards and I'll make sure that we get that to him. But we want to bless that family and we want to encourage them because one of the biggest lies that, a, that the enemy tells a missionary, and I know this because I have served as a missionary and this is the lie that I heard. The biggest lie the missionary, the enemy tells a missionary is you're all alone. Nobody cares about you. Nobody's thinking about you. Uh, they all say good things when you're around, but you know what? You're all alone. You're out here you're in the middle of nowhere. You're disconnected from your family. You're disconnected from your church family. Your kids don't have any kind of real sense of church family, and you are all alone. Well, we want to shatter the lie of the enemy. We want to say to them, you are not alone. We are with you, and we want to be an encouragement to you. And you have already been an encouragement to that family in so many different ways, and we want to, uh, we really want to overwhelm them with encouragement, uh, if you will. Luke chapter 9 where we're going to be at. We're continuing our series called Following Jesus. Uh, my name is Derek, and I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here at First Baptist Tillman's Corner. And if you're joining us online or if you're joining us in the room, we're very thankful that you're here and very thankful we get to spend some time together in God's Word. Uh, you know, I was looking back over my notes, and every year in January, I preach basically the same sermon series with, with a little different twist. And it is, it's the new year, it's time to get in the Word, 
time to spend some time with the Lord. Uh, let's, let's rethink our evangelism. Let's rethink uh, getting involved in some small groups. And so uh, I just intend to do that every January to make sure that we're covering the basics. Uh, you know, it's like when football season starts off and we say we're going to learn how to block, we're going to learn how to tackle, uh, we're going to learn how to throw, and we're going to learn how to catch. Just kind of a back to the basics kind of thing. Uh, well, as I was preparing for this sermon and I really wanted to preach on Luke chapter 9, uh, I looked back through my notes and recognized that I have preached on on this very same saying of Jesus out of the book of Matthew. And, and I thought as I, my first thought was, well, I need to find another passage to preach out of. But then I thought, no, this is such an important passage. I'm going to preach out of Luke's version of it. And that led me, the more I studied it, to think I'll probably preach this same passage or same saying of Jesus some point in January uh, for uh, as, as long as the Lord allows or would lead me to because it's such an important passage. It is the quintessential passage about discipleship. It is where Jesus says, this is what it means to follow me. And so today's message in following Jesus is the call to discipleship. And here's the thing. You, we kind of think of discipleship as something other than being a Christian. We think of it as like a master's degree in being a Christian. Well, you're a Christian, you get saved, and then some people get really serious about their Christianity, and those people, um, they do something called discipleship. But when the Bible speaks of discipleship, that's really not what it means at all. When the Bible speaks of discipleship, being a disciple and being a Christian are synonymous. You don't get saved and then later become a disciple. The moment that you get saved, you're stepping into discipleship. And so I want us to understand from this passage what Jesus is actually telling us about discipleship. And we're going to read Luke chapter 9 verse 23 and we're going to do something I don't normally encourage you to do. That is, we're going to take a verse and we're just going to pull it out and read it all by itself. And, and we're going to, for a moment, ignore the context and we're going to look at just what the verse says. But then we're going to come back at the, toward the end and look at the context and the context will become very important for us. So let's just look at the verse, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. The Bible says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke chapter 9 verse 23 tells us clearly, Jesus is calling you to be his disciple. Would you pray with me that God would open our eyes to this truth? God, would you, through the power of your spirit and the power of your word, open our eyes to see that you are calling us to be your disciple? And Lord, would you give us the faith and courage to answer that call? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is calling you to be his disciple. You saw it, didn't you? He said to all, if anyone. This call is for everyone. Is it for saved people or is it for lost people? Yes. If anyone. If you want to come after Jesus, if you want to be his disciple, uh, if anyone would follow me, that word follow is the word that is used for discipleship all throughout the ministry of Jesus. It's used over and over and over and over again in the Gospels and almost never is it used other than someone following Jesus. It's always in the context of someone following Jesus. And so we want today to come to this idea of following Jesus. And what does it look like? If Jesus is calling you to follow him, then what does following look like? What does discipleship look like? What does it take to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, it's very straightforward in the passage. That's why I love this saying of Jesus. Jesus makes it clear for us. He says, first, you deny yourself. Deny yourself. Now, there are some things that are simple that are not necessarily easy. So you think about a, a getting in shape. What does it take to get in shape? Well, you got to eat right. You got to exercise. Simple, right? But not easy, right? So discipleship is the same way. Following Jesus is very simple. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. But simple is not always easy. Deny yourself. Deny yourself is the foundational piece. It, it's the hard part of it. In fact, in some ways, to deny yourself is to take up your cross and follow Jesus. So in some ways, they're all three the same thing. But it starts with this idea of denying yourself. Think about that phrase. Deny yourself. Say no to yourself. Yourself wants to do something, and yourself tells yourself no. That's difficult stuff. 
you know, from time to time you encounter a salesman, I have no doubt. Uh, maybe you've bought something that a salesman sold you and, and you weren't necessarily intending on buying that or maybe you were going in to buy this model car and they talked you into a newer model car or they talked you into a car with a little bit uh, more of the extras, you know, something like that. You've dealt with a salesman and salesmen can be very convincing. That's their job is to convince you of your need for a product. But I want to tell you the salesman that you will deal with that will get you in the most trouble is yourself. The hardest salesman you'll ever encounter is yourself. You go to a salesman and you say, well, I want to buy this car. And the salesman says, well, what about this car? And you say, well, this car is out of my budget. And the salesman says, oh, no, I can make that work. We'll just do a little this, do a little bit of that. We'll add a few months on the payments. And all, all of a sudden, it's within your budget. And you say, yeah, but I really need the used one. Yeah, but have you seen the warranty on the new one? Yeah, but I'm going to get the used one and I'm going to, I'm going to add some things to it. Yeah, but all those things are already on this. Look, I actually happen to have it and it's already in your wife's favorite color. How do you know my wife's favorite color. I emailed her while you weren't looking. I mean, we've got this set up. You know, every excuse you give a, a good salesman, that salesman has a way. They've been trained to redirect you away from that excuse. Well, listen, every excuse you come up with to say no to yourself, your flesh already has a way to redirect you away from that. It's the most difficult enemy you'll ever deal with is yourself. Sometimes we say the devil made me do it. <laughs> Most of the time, the devil who made you do it is your own flesh. James said, yes, the devil plays a role. There's no doubt about that. He's designed a world filled with things that would draw us away from the Lord. But then James says, each one is tempted by his own evil desire when he is dragged away and enticed. Deny yourself. Say no to yourself. That's your biggest battle. And yes, this is for those who don't know the Lord. It's for the lost. I mean, if you don't know the Lord... One of the biggest things you've got to do is say no to yourself. You've got to let go of all that. Come to Jesus. Deny yourself. But it's also for Christians. Deny yourself. Deny yourself daily. In just a moment, we'll see. Take up your cross daily. I, I think that daily applies to all three of these. Daily. See, you can deny yourself on Monday, but that doesn't apply to Tuesday. You can deny yourself in 2023... But 2024 is a new year. Deny yourself. Say no to yourself. After you deny yourself, Jesus says, you deny yourself, say no to yourself, uh, push away from what you want and your desires, put your desires uh, in last place, deny yourself, take up your cross daily. Take up your cross. Now, we like to think of the metaphorical side of taking up your cross. But remember, when Jesus first said this, this was no metaphor. This is a real deal. This is, this is uh, something like Jesus gathering us all together and saying, if you want to follow me, if you want to come after me, then deny yourself and sit down in your electric chair. Go, Ooh, that sounds weird. Well, that's what Jesus said to his followers. Deny yourself and take up your cross. To us, the cross is a symbol. The cross is a necklace. The cross is something beautiful. The cross is something that we celebrate because we understand although it was ugly, it was also beautiful. But for those disciples, for Jesus to look at them and say, deny yourself and take up your cross, what they had in mind was something a little different. Perhaps they had in mind the 6,000 slaves who were crucified about 100 years before this in the Spartacus revolt, lined the sides of the street. Rome wants to make sure that any potential enemy of Rome knows you do not cross Rome. So they crucify them, and they crucify them and in public places so that you can see them, and, and they can make a statement. This is what happens to anyone who defies Rome. Take up your cross. You know, I was reading about crucifixion in preparation for this sermon earlier this week, and I read something that I loved to read. It said this, it said there were thousands, hundreds, perhaps hundreds of thousands of victims of Roman crucifixion. And it said, no, there's no record of anyone ever surviving a Roman crucifixion. And I thought, well, there's one. <laughs> uh, he survived through resurrection. But deny yourself, take up your cross. So yes, it's metaphorical. We'll come back to that in a moment, it is metaphorical. We know it is because Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross daily. So you can't 
be executed every day, but there has to be some sense of suffering to this. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and suffer. You're going to suffer if you follow Jesus. And you're going to suffer not just the way the world suffers. See, the, the entire world suffers. Everyone in the world suffers. No matter what your ideology is, no matter what your religion is, where you're from, you can't get through a broken world without being uh, suffering in a broken world with brokenness all around you. It's going to happen. And so everyone suffers. But I'm not talking about the kind of suffering that comes from disease or natural disaster or from some kind of difficulty around you. I'm talking about the unique suffering that comes because you say, I am with Jesus. I'm one of his. I identify with him. I have taken up my cross. When you pick up that cross, there is a cultural shame that comes upon you from being a follower of Jesus. For some people, that suffering is small. And honestly, for most of us, it's a small amount of suffering. We might lose out on a promotion at our job, or we might be shunned from some kind of social event, or we might not be the most popular person in our office or in our uh, circle of of influence. But for other Christians in some parts of the world, it literally means death. I mean, there are people that just to utter the phrase, I follow Jesus, would be a death sentence for them. But regardless of whether God calls us to suffer uh, in a big way or in a small way, God calls all followers of Jesus to suffer. Deny yourself, take up your cross. When you pick that cross up, there is suffering that comes with following Jesus. So, when you come to Christ, I want you to say, Pastor, this is speaking of salesmen. This is a pretty bad sales pitch. You're talking me out of following Jesus. Well, the reason that I'm giving you this sales pitch, if you will, is because this is the one Jesus gives. Jesus says, listen, I want you to hear what it means to follow me. I want you to count the cost before you build the tower. If you come after me, it means denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following me. And there's an aspect of suffering. Luke's a account of this tells us that Jesus added that word daily. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. So it is metaphorical. It's not just the suffering aspect of it. It's a daily picking up of your identity with Jesus. Deciding today I will follow Jesus. Tomorrow I will follow Jesus. The next day I will follow Jesus. Deciding to follow Jesus, yes, is a one in a uh, one-time event for, for us. There comes a moment where we say, I'm all in, I want to follow Jesus. But then you know as a follower of Christ, you've got to redecide, recommit every single day of your life. That means if you're here today and you were fully, you were all good up through yesterday, that means today is a brand new day and it is time to recommit to follow Jesus. That every day when you wake up, Lord, today is your day and I will follow you. A recommitment to follow Jesus. There were 365 days in 2023. How did it go for you? If we were to put those on a scale and say, well, X out of 365, I really, I really was denying self and taking up my cross. We get an extra day in 2024, right? 366 days. So how will it look in 2024? That's why I want to come to you with this early in the year. So you can grab this year before the enemy would take it from you and think about what it means to deny yourself and, and take up your cross daily and then follow Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means to go where Jesus goes. It means to do what Jesus does. It means to stay so closely to him that you know where he is going and you know what he is doing. It implies a closeness with Jesus that allows you to follow him. And that means you're not in the lead, and I'm not in the lead. And sometimes Jesus says, I'm going to go this way. And you say, well, I really think we should go that way. But you follow Jesus anyway. And sometimes as you're coming across God's Word, you have to go back to this whole deny yourself. You're reading in God's Word, and you say, well, you know, this is what the Bible says about how I ought to handle that, and I really don't want to do it that way, frankly. So, you say, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to pick up my cross that causes me to suffer because I've decided to follow Jesus, and now I'm going to do what Jesus would have me to do. I'm going to go where he would go. I'm going to talk to who he would talk to. I'm going to follow him. It also implies, as I said, that closeness where you're walking in step with the Spirit and the Lord will lead you according to his word through the power of his Spirit. And God rarely leads us places that we would choose to go. So in that moment, we say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. You know, Lindsay and I never imagined 
we would serve as church planting missionaries in the city of Miami. Now, when God got us there, we, we loved every minute of it. It was hard work, it was difficult, but God blessed us so much through all of that. But, but I used to tell people, God would call you, my, God might call you to, to go to Miami or to go to the other side of the world or to be a, a, a cross-cultural missionary. We're all missionaries. But some missionaries are called to be cross-cultural missionaries. They go into cultures they don't know. You have to learn the culture and you have to understand how the gospel will, would infuse that culture. And you learn the language and you learn the dress and you learn the customs of a culture not your own. You learn all of these things. And that's, that's a difficult call. And some of you might say, God would never call me to do that. I promise you, you wouldn't be any more shocked if God called you to be a missionary than Lindsay and I were when God called us to plant a church in Miami, Florida. But it was so clear. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Sometimes that following, it'll lead you places that you wouldn't choose to go yourself. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. So again, how'd you do in 2023? What did that look like? How'd you do yesterday? How's it going today? Is today a day of self-denial, taking up your cross and following Jesus? And if it is, then praise God, tomorrow is coming. And what I'm asking you to do here at the beginning of the year is to say, tomorrow is going to be a day where my feet are going to hit the floor and I'm going to say, today is yours, Lord, and I am following you. And then the next day and the next day and the next day. Because I don't know if you've noticed or not, but our world is in a mess right now. Our culture is in a mess right now. And yes, the whole world's in a mess. The whole world's always in a mess. But it seems to have hit home more in recent years than it has in times past. And there's a tension and there's a pulling and there's a division and there, there are pressures coming. And by the way, did you notice that this is 2024? What does that mean? It's an election year. I don't have to tell you that the pressure is going to get greater. The pulling and the division and all the forces are going to get greater. It's going to be more divisive in 2024. In fact, if you said, I'm, I'm glad we got through 2023 and all the mess that was there, I promise you 2024 has got enough of its own mess. And the world needs to know there is hope and there is light and there is truth. And ladies and gentlemen, we have it. But if we lose sight, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus. Say no to yourself. Be willing to identify with Jesus and even suffer at, with, with what comes along with that. And then follow Jesus. Go to places you wouldn't go on your own. Uh, have conversations you wouldn't have. Lead him as he follows. If we fail to do that, either individually as a church or as a church, then ladies and gentlemen, we will miss out on what God is doing. Do you know God is going to save people in Tillman's Corner? This year in 2024, lives are going to be changed. People are going to be healed. Marriages are going to be put back together. People are going to be given hope. They're going to see the light of the gospel. God is going to do that. God is in the saving business. God saves people. He never stops. He never rests from his mission of reaching people who are far from God and bringing them into a relationship and making them part of his family and part of his kingdom. He's going to do that in Mobile. He's going to do it in Southeast Asia. He's going to do it all over the world and he will do it with us and through us or he will do it without us. I want to be part of it. Don't you? Don't you want to be a church that's right in the middle of what God is doing in Tillman's Corner, what God is doing in Mobile and beyond? Don't you want to be a, a person, an individual person? I mean, listen, God uses our church. We know we see God use our church in great ways, but it can be easy to be a part of a church like this and kind of be on the outside of that and say, well, man, I know God really uses our church, but, but that's not really, God doesn't really use me. I want you to be in a place where you get to see the work of God, experience the work of God, and be part of the work of God. The world needs it. Your church family needs it. We need you. We need you. In fact, our spiritual health will be increased and blessed if today you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. To be a, a disciple of Jesus. To really be sold out to him. You say, well, this is not what I signed up for. Actually, it is what you signed up for. Whether you walked down an aisle and knelt in an altar like this one or you sat in your seat and 
prayed to the Lord and surrendered your life to him. Or maybe you were in a car somewhere driving down the road and the Holy Spirit convicted you of your sin and you surrendered to Jesus. Or maybe you were like my mom, 12 years old in a ditch in the front yard, got saved right there. You can get saved anywhere. God is everywhere. The Holy Spirit can work anywhere and you can get saved anywhere. But do you know when that happened, actually this is what you signed up for. Sometimes as Christians, I think we're kind of like that, that teenage young man, 18 years old, and says, I'm tired of y'all telling me what to do. I'm going to join the Marines. Y'all have heard that story before, right? <laughs> Sometimes as Christians, I, I think that's how we think it is. Man, when we kneel in an altar, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right, let's, let's back up a little bit. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Okay, good. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is, what's that word? Lord. Yes, Lord means he is Yahweh in the flesh. But it also means he is boss. He is in charge. He is the one who gives us our marching orders. He is the one we follow. And so when we come, whether it's a place like this or some other place, and we surrender our lives to Jesus, it, we don't get the saved part without getting the Jesus is Lord part. So discipleship's for all of us. It's what we're all called to. Now, we may not be doing it. We may be living in disobedience to the Lord. But discipleship is not master's level Christianity. It is intro level. It is Christianity 101. It's what we're all called to do. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus. How is it going in your life? So I can't do that. You know, you know you're right. You cannot. I can't do it. I mean, just go back to the beginning. Deny yourself. The moment that yourself starts to fight with yourself and yourself wins the battle over yourself, well, now you've got to deny the new yourself, right? I mean, it's just, how do you do this? Deny myself. How do I do this? Do you know the Bible is filled, especially the New Testament, filled with commands that God commands us to do that we can't actually obey in and of our own self. It gives us a reliance on him. Lord, you've called me to deny myself, take up my cross and follow you. And I cannot do that. And God says, that's okay. I will fill you with my spirit. And from the inside out, I will empower you to do the very thing I've called you to do. But you've got to understand this is your call. You can't, you can't say, well, that's not me. I don't want that. And have the Holy Spirit working inside of you to do this. You know, I said I wanted to come back to the context, and I do. I want to come back to the context because, again, this verse, we kind of ripped it out of its context and looked at it. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus. I want to look back at the context. Jesus has taken his disciples on this spiritual retreat gone as far north as he can go with his disciples and still be in Israel. Some of you have been to Caesarea Philippi where this event took place. So this is in the far northern part of Israel. And they're on this kind of spiritual retreat. And Jesus asks a question. Who do you say that I, who do people say that I am? And they give different answers. And then who do you say that I am? And Peter gives that great confession. In the book of Luke, he records it for us as Peter saying, you are the Christ of God. Gives this great confession. Right answer, Luke. A right answer, uh, Peter. And then in the other Gospels, we have this, this interaction between Peter that, that the other Gospels record for us where Jesus says, you know, I'm going to be crucified. And, and, and Peter says, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> and, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And Jesus says, oh, yes, I will. And you get behind me, Satan. We don't have that interaction in Luke. Luke leaves that part out for a purpose. He leaves it out for us so that we can see the connection between what Jesus says and his call to us. In the other Gospels, after that interaction with Peter, then Jesus calls everyone to him and says, look, if anybody's going to come after me, this is what it's going to look like. But look back at Luke chapter 9, verse 22. So Jesus calls them together. And he says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. 
And then the next words out of his mouth in Luke's account, and he said to all, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. He, Luke is leaving out that interaction between Jesus and Peter so that we don't miss the connection. Do you see the connection? Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to die. Now, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And Jesus says, everything I'm asking you to do is rooted and grounded in what I'm going to do. I'm not going to send you out there to do something in and of your own power. In fact, you're going to follow me through this. You're going to do what I do. So I'm going to lay my own will to the side. Father, not my will, but yours. And I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to suffer. I'm going to take up my cross a very physical way. And I'm going to carry it. I'm going to die. And I'm asking you to do the same thing. Deny yourself. You take up your cross. And you follow me. Are you willing to follow Jesus? Knowing that where he's taking you leads to a crucifixion. But Jesus didn't stop there, did he? So he said, Pastor, you're leaving part out. I know I'm leaving part out. We're going to get back to that. But I want you to feel this. I want you to understand that Jesus ties this call to discipleship to his own crucifixion. So if you say, man, I'm in on the going to heaven part, but I don't like the suffering part. You can't have it. The call, the sales pitch, the, the, the thing is, come to me. And when you come to me and follow me, you will follow me where I go. And where I go is actually to a place of suffering. Now, we don't actually go to the same cross that Jesus went to. We can't. You and I couldn't die for the sins of humanity if we wanted to, and none of us wants to. But we do follow Jesus to suffering. And we follow him to a very different kind of crucifixion. A crucifixion that he didn't undergo. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. He also says that when we are, uh, when we are buried in baptism, we're buried with him in his death. See, we have a sin nature that is crucified at our salvation. We lay it down on the cross and we say, I want this part of me to die. I am crucifying at this part of who I am. Jesus didn't have that. So that part of us is crucified and we follow Jesus to the cross in that way. When we come in salvation, we are laying our life down. Oh, but then there's the other side of this verse where Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So, Jesus says to us, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I'm going to be raised. If any man would come after me, if any man would be my disciple, if any man would follow me, if any man wants to be a part of my kingdom, part of my family, if any man wants to be saved, if anyone, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Yes, follow him to crucifixion. But ladies and gentlemen, do you see He's not just calling us to follow him to crucifixion. He is calling us to follow him to resurrection. Because if you try to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it anyway. But if you'll follow me, if you'll deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, then you will follow me, yes, to crucifixion, to the cross, but you will also follow me to resurrection and you will actually save your life. And what Jesus is saying, especially if you don't know him, I want you to listen real closely. If you said, I don't really care about all this Christianity thing, it's just a bunch of rules, I don't really want to have anything to do with it, I can't do it, I can't be a good person, wish I could be a better person, but I can't do all that. All of that, the way you're thinking is not right right about Christianity. Here's what Christianity is. Christianity is if you want your life, the only way to really get it is to lay it down. God's not trying to take your life from you. He's trying to give your life to you. Because here's, here's the thing. The world is filled with ways that will tell you to find life. And the further we get into this, this insane experiment into self-actualization um, and autonomy, and I am my own God, 
And I'll just go the way I go, and I'll do what I think is right, and I do what I feel is right, and I just kind of go down this road. The further we get down this road, the more obvious it ought to be to us that that path does not lead to life. It leads to death. Do you see the very words of Jesus reflected in that? If you try to save yourself, if you try to grab all that you can and be all that you can for you and for self, and if self is the center, you will lose your life. It'll slip right out of your hands when you try to grab a hold of it and hold on to it and hold closely to it. It will leave you. But if you will lay it down, then you will find life, eternal life, and abundant life. And that's what Jesus is calling you to. He's calling you to discipleship, not because he needs another disciple, not because his discipleship numbers are down, not because the charts in heaven don't look good anymore. Jesus is calling you to discipleship because he wants to save your life. And he knows the only way for you to find eternal and abundant life that's not just hereafter, but is here today, right now. The only way for you to find it is to say no to yourself, to take up your cross and to follow Jesus. And if you will follow him, him, then it will lead, yes, to suffering. But on the other side of that, it will lead to resurrection. Every other ideology, every other religion in the world is filled with people who suffer. Christians are no different. In fact, some people suffer for their faith. Some people suffer because they're Muslim. Some people suffer because they're Jewish. Some people suffer because they're Buddhist. So we're not even unique in that necessarily. But let me tell you what makes Christian suffering different from all other suffering. What makes Christian suffering different from all of their suffering is that it comes with a promise. Your suffering will lead to life. And there is a resurrection on the other side of the cross. And Jesus proved it when he was crucified on Friday and he walked out on Sunday. And the Bible says he is the first fruits, the first of many brothers so if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, that is the invitation that is being extended to you. You deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus, give up your life, lay it down, surrender to him as Lord, and you will find your life. But you say no to him? You say, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna hold on to it. And you will watch little by little, year by year, decade by decade, sometimes in great strides and sometimes... In small steps, you will watch your life slip out of your hands and everything you love and everything that's important to you will all just kind of crumble. But in the kingdom, it just gets better and better. In the kingdom, yes, we suffer, but boy, we suffer with the great comfort of the presence of Almighty God. We suffer in the presence of a great faith family. We suffer with a hope with a sure hope that God is and will make it all right. I don't know today what God is doing in your heart. All I ask you to do is be obedient. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus. You've given your life to him, but maybe you kind of misunderstood. Thought, yeah, I just kind of wanted to be a Christian and I didn't think about all that deny yourself stuff. It's, it's a package deal. And it's for your good. It's for your good. God is calling you to life through denying yourself, taking up your cross and following him. Or maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe God has brought you here today. Maybe God has brought you into this room or God has brought you to a place where you're watching online so that you could hear the path to life is actually by laying your life down. That someone, Jesus, died in your place and was resurrected to eternal life to give you the opportunity to be forgiven of your sin to have eternal and abundant life. Whatever God is doing in your life, all I ask you to do is be obedient. Father, would you, in this room right now, work through the power of your spirit. Lord, for those who are watching online, God, would you, through the power of your spirit, right where they are, work in their heart, give courage, give faith. Lord, bring faith. Let it rise up in hearts all across this room. And Lord, bring sinners to salvation. And bring the saints into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.